Good morning. Years ago, I read a book called What My Parents Did Right. And the theme throughout the book was not just why what you say, just your words, which that's still so important, but your actual being, how your children see you day after day after day. So it's my pleasure, and I don't want you to come up yet, Dad, because uh, close uh, proximity might get me a little teary-eyed. The older I get, the uh, more sentimental and nostalgic that I become about my family. We're about six hours apart, and I know to some people that's not a lot of distance, but uh, we just don't see each other as much as I would like to. But I just wanted to um, tell my parents this and the three things that I saw the most from as I was raised, and I do have the sweetest memories of my childhood. One of the things that he taught me was to love the Lord in everything that I did, no matter what I did, whether it was through uh, our singing, which he helped give me a love for singing. He constantly would call me up, and he called me Lester. That was my nickname. And he'd say, come on up, Lester. Let's sing a song together. So he helped with my stage fright, because I was a very shy, timid little girl, and they helped to give me voice lessons. And I know that money was tight sometimes, but they sacrificed for me. So that brought out a very timid little girl and helped me uh, when I sang to sing out. And in money and what we had, we didn't have a lot, but every Sunday my mom had an envelope for me and would put money in it. And she would say, now one day when you get a job, you're going to give 10% of this back to the Lord. So I, that stuck with me also. Secondly, they taught me to love my neighbor as myself. Every day there was time set aside that they would reach out and be a blessing to someone else. So many times I crawled in the car beside my mom and she had a big bowl of soup to take to someone that was hurting, depressed, or had lost a loved one. And last but not least, I just found out, I think my dad's talking about this today, but uh, just he had a perpetual joy in his heart, no matter what was going on at church or a personal life. Um, they didn't let us see that. I'm sure behind closed doors there were things said, but they never let us see that. They always, he always showed joy to us. That's what my sister and I remember the most. So there's so much more I could say, but Dad, come on up, and we're going to sing a song. I'm sorry, with, with our memory going, it's the only one we remember that we can sing without looking at words and without my sister playing for us. This is true. I brought a uh, CD today that I really, 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 really we did want to sing. But she said, hey, Dad, how about singing that song we did before? Well, how can I refuse? So here goes a cappella and all. all right? This goes back a lot of years, Lester, uh, before we sang this song. Here we go. Gabriel's golden trumpet sounds, all the saints will leave the ground. They are rising up to meet the blessed Lord. How they shout as they rise to the home beyond the skies. They're in the bride of Christ and they are coming home. And here they come. Marching up to Zion's hill, the victory's won as they bow before God's Son. The bride of Jesus is coming home. Here comes Mom and here comes Dad. Oh, their faces look so glad as they march and they sing redemption song. What a smile on their face as they sing amazing grace. They're in the bride of Christ and they are coming home. And here they come. Here they come a thrill. What a thrill. Here, here they come, come marching up, up to Zion's hill. The victory's won. God's Son, the Bride of Jesus, is coming home. The Bride of Jesus is coming home. 
You do in the middle of all, I'll drag that CD out, you'll hear another one. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's just a joy to be here today, and we always enjoy coming to, to Wichita to see the children, and uh, of course, uh, not just Bruce and Leslie, but Brad and Bryson as well. Uh, it's, we've, our children uh, have been such a blessing to us. Uh, our older daughter, Kathy, uh, our backyard's beat in Palmham, and uh, the trouble is to put a gate there so he can come and eat with us. But other than that, it was kind of a joy. But uh, they, we, we, they, they're right there. And then, of course, Leslie lives too far away for us. We, we wish she was in Dallas. But they're happy, and, uh, and they're where God wants them. And that means so much to, to their mother and myself. Someone said, I'd rather have my daughter in, in uh, darkest Africa happy and doing God's will than next door out of the will of God. She's safer there that she would be beside me if she wasn't doing what God wanted her to do. Like I said, it's always a joy to be. I've preached here before on about two or three different occasions. It's always a pleasure. Uh, if you'll give me your attention, I'll try not to be real long-winded. Uh, I, by nature, preach about 25 minutes usually. Uh, I heard of this, somebody, I, this, somebody pulled this on me at the coffee the other day, a gentleman that I knew. In fact, he was at the church where I pastored 27 years. He was there when I went there. And he's still going there today, local businessman. He said, Brother Gene said, man, we had an exciting service Sunday at our church. And I said, you did? I said, well, what happened? Tell me about it. So we had it on the second row from the front. So a little lady fell over and had a heart attack and just slumped over in the seat. I said, oh, my goodness, no. Well, what happened, Seb? He said, well, so we called the paramedics. Well, good, a good. I said, what happened? They said they carried out three people before they got the right one. Everybody's asleep. So hopefully you won't do that to me. But today I'll try to be a little bit more lively uh, than that. Anyway, we're, we're, we're very happy to be here. And uh, I won't take any more time just to talking. I can do that for, forever. But if you'll open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're just going to look at two verses of Scripture and just a phrase out of that that we're going to take a, a message from. Before you find your turning there, I will tell you that the, the day that uh, the pastor called me to preach here, that morning I, I walk one mile at the football stadium every morning at 6.15 and uh, get my adrenaline going, whatever there's left of it, and uh, get me kind of going in the morning. And, and this message came to me that morning. I was just thanking God for his goodness toward us and the family and, and how wonderful we've been treated and what God's led us to do. And uh, so this is what you're going to get today. Uh, the message that I got that morning. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, the writer says, that will be the, will be the Apostle Paul, said, Wherefore, because these other men and women have been so faithful, Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter of the Bible, because they've, they've been true, because they've did this by grace, and this by grace, and this by faith, and this by faith. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed to Bible, so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Let us run with patience our course that God has laid out for us. Your course is not Brother Thomas's course. Your course may not be my course. But I believe that for a saved believer, God has a course for every one of us. And he says, run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That phrase, who for the joy that was set before him. And the message this morning entitled, For the Joy. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for my privilege is speaking at Glenville Baptist Church today. We're thankful for our son-in-law, the pastor, who's been a blessing to our family through the years, and for, of course, for our daughter, who we love so dearly, and our grandsons that are so precious to us. And we love this church because our kids love this church, and we're so happy they're here. But I pray that today that you'll be with Brother Bruce where he is. You'll help him. Then, Father, be with me. May the Holy Spirit of God speak through me. That just won't just be another sermon people have had to sit through. 
that it be the Holy Spirit of God speaking through the preacher this morning. So Father, help me in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the joy. Joy is a precious commodity in our society. Very few people have real joy. They may have pleasure for a season. In fact, it's said of Moses that he refused to be called the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter and, and didn't enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There's a lot of things that people are looking for, for pleasure in our world. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, in our society nowadays, the preacher never has any want of preaching material. <laughs> you can see a lot of things to preach about in, in our society. But for us who are the believers, for us who are saved, there should be joy in our lives. Joy is a wonderful word. It, it's a very glad feeling, happiness, much pleasure. The Bible, it means delight, rejoice, glory. And it appears 164 times in the Word of God. Luke chapter 2 and verse 10, when the angels announced the birth of Jesus Christ, they said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Great joy. Luke 15, 7, joy shall be in, the, in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Today, if one sinner, one lost person comes to know Christ as Savior, according to the Bible, there's rejoicing in heaven when that decision is made, when someone changes their future from hell to heaven, changes their destiny forever. That's a joy in heaven. I believe that Brother Thomas has been talking about the church. And you may, you may accuse me of some things, and some things may be true of which you accuse me, but you will not accuse me of not loving the church. I've always loved the church. I've heard people say, well, I can worship God on a creek bank, big kitchen, and bass. Yeah, but you don't. Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. If he loves it, I should love it. Now, my wife and I have been married coming on 57 years pretty soon, in October. And I, I, I've never been a real shopper. She, rather, is the queen of shoppers. I guarantee you no one can. Out, my daughters can't out walk her out shop her today. She's, I'm going to tell her how old she is, but she's not 50 anymore. Friday is her day. Friday, we live in Bonham, which is about 10,000 people. We go to Sherman on, on Fridays. I drive out to Sherman, and I park the car. And she gets out at the Dollar Tree, Hobby Lobby, Belk, Ross, T.J. Maxx, J.C. Penney's. And then we had breakfast when we got there. Then we stopped by Wendy's to get one of those Frosties and sip on that for about 20 miles going home. Do I love shopping? No, but I love her. So the things that she loves, I kind of have an affinity for as well. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. I love the church today. Why do you labor in the church? Why would you work in the church? Well, I think you should do it because you love the church. I think you'll do it because it's your duty to do it. You know, it's, it's, it's my duty to be a good husband and father. Whether I want to do it or not, that's, just, that's my duty. I should do that. I should be a good grandparent to, to Brett and Bryson. No, whether I feel like it or not, I should do it. It's duty. How about rewards? There's a reward for doing things for God. And I'm not talking about just in heaven. But I've heard stories about, you know, people, well, if you've never done anything bad, you know, what do you want to live on for? If you're going, going, going to die, you don't do anything fun. I'd match my life up with just about ever, anybody else in this world of just being where God wants you to be. I practiced in the same church 27 years. Was everything rosy? Uh-uh. Was everything always woo-hoo-hoo? Nope. But that's where God wanted me. That's where I stayed. I went to the VA hospital and was a chaplain there for 10 years after I retired from the church, and I loved every minute of it. I loved it. It was rewarding. Yeah, it paid well. That was rewarding. But I love those old veterans. I remember Garland Stonker. Garland is 96 now. He's been out there 30 years. He's paralyzed on this side. He was in the Seabees in World War II. Here's what I get from Garland. Stonker said, hey, 
Preacher, I said, Captain, I was going to say, come on, girl. I said, I'm going to sing five songs. She said, I'm going to my room and lock the door. <laughs> and headed out. He always came back. But why should we, we serve God? Why should we be true to Glenville? Well, think about it for a minute. Let's do it for the joy. Let's just do it for the joy. I've, I've just jotted down a few things here where joy should be involved when we think about it. Think about, first of all, for the joy of love unmeasured. Love has kind of been cheapened in our society, but in the Bible, it's a wonderful word. Love. Agape love. That's the, in the Greek, it means that love that's self-giving. So I'd rather go to the ball game, but I'll go shopping with you. I'd rather have a T-bone steak, but if you like enchiladas, we'll have that. See, that's love. That's love. Do without for, you, for what you want for someone else. I like that kind of love. And God has that kind of love. Jot it down some scripture, Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8, which, which is really two of my favorite scriptures, uh, verses that, that I really love when it comes to the love of God. If I can ever find it, it's here somewhere. I don't say I'm taking another Bible. Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. God didn't love you because you were great. God didn't love you because you were big. No. But the first part of verse 8, it said, but because the Lord loved you. It's the Lord loved you, period. Why am I saved today? Because the Lord loved me. Why am I, why am I how did I get, why did I get the pastor of those years? Because the Lord loved me. For the joy of love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. John 15, 13, greater love of no man than this, that a man laid in his life for his friends. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us. And while we were sinners, Christ died for us. I'm not a real Dennis the Menace fan. I don't, I don't, it's not in our paper all the time. But it came out the other day and had one that was really great. I don't know if you saw it or not. But Dennis is coming out of Mrs. Wilson's house. Now, you know Mr. Wilson, don't you? Mr. Wilson's the grouch that lives next door. But Mrs. Wilson's a typical grandmother image. White hair and glasses, and she's always breaking cookies. And so Dennis, and I think the little boy's name is Joey. I'm not sure about that. They're coming out the door with cookies in both hands. And the little, the little friend of Dennis says, Boy, Dennis... We must have been awfully good to get these cookies. And Dennis says, no, Ms. Wilson's good. And that's the way it is with us. We're not good. God's good. He's the one who loves us more than we love him. The young preacher was engaged to a very beautiful young lady, but found he was going blind. And she came and gave his engagement ring back to him. He said, I couldn't stand to be married to a blind preacher. He, with a broken heart, sits down at home and writes these words. Not about her, but about him. Oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. That's God's love. That's love unmeasured, by the way. Secondly, for the joy of sins forgiven. Well, that's a wonderful thing, to think our sins are forgiven. To forgive means to give up resentment against someone, to give up all claims to punish, to cancel a debt. And biblically, when the word forgiven is used, it means to send away. Get rid of that, get rid of that sin. It's gone. My, when I, when I, the, the resentment I had, the, the judgment I had against you, it's gone. That's why God says on several occasions, number one, I will bury your sins where? The deepest sea. Again, I will put my sins, your sins behind my back. Thirdly, I will put them as far as east is from the west. Now, why did he say north to south? Because north to south has a limit. If you go to the North Pole and go on the other side, you'd be going south. But you can go east forever. If you go east, you can go east circle a number of times, you'll still be going. God says, I love you that much. You can go around forever, and I'll still be loving 
you. Joy of sins forgiven. You see, that's a deliberate choice on the part of God. God chooses to forgive us. He doesn't have to, but he chooses to do it. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God who, who, for, that brought salvation and appeared to all men. And then I want to turn over and read it personally in Titus chapter 3, verses 3, 4, and 5. That's worth reading today. Titus chapter 3, verses 3, 4, and 5. And I'll, I'll get there soon. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness we've done, but by his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The joy of sins forgiven. That's a, that's a deliberate act of God. And it was proven at the finished work of Christ on Calvary when he died for our sins. But this, all this forgiveness has to be a deliberate choice for us to get it. You just can't, you, just don't, you, don't just, you can't just be given and you pass it by. You've got to take it. You have to receive it. If today I ask one of my grandsons, if I lifted up a $100 bill, would he come and get it? I would guarantee he would do it. Would he think that if I had, instead of that, an IOU from Walmart? No. They had trust Papa enough to, to feel like that he was going to give him the right thing. I heard a song the other day by the Perrys. Now you have to look me over. Look, 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 we got to look over me a little bit because my 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 grandparents came from the hills of Kentucky, and Southern gospel music's in my blood. And I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to tell you the words. If you're wandering in the darkness, come and step into the light. Nail scarred hands are there to help you, to pull you safe from death to life. Friend, I too have stood where you stand. Could I trust in things unseen? But just one step in his direction. And then in love he ran to me. That's forgiveness. That's the love of God for us. Thirdly, the joy of paths directed. I've been saved for about 56 years now. And I haven't had to tread this path alone. God has always been with me. In Proverbs 3 and verse 6, the Bible says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. Now, we want God to direct our paths, but we don't want to acknowledge him. <laughs> we will do our thing and say, Now, here I am, God. We, I wish you'd pay attention. I'm going down this direction. And God says, I don't want you there. I want you to go this direction. Acknowledge him, what he wants, and he will direct your paths. Very, very important. Psalm 23, 3, he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads me, he's with me, he directs me. He never leaves me alone. Paul said, God stood with me. God was always with me. I read a little story about an Indian boy who was being initiated into the tribe. And he was supposed to spend the night in the darkest part of the forest. And he was so tired when he finally got there, he, he just sat down under a tree and wondered if he was going to make it through the night. And all of a sudden, approaching him was a very large bear. And he, had just, he, he just backed up against the tree, terrified. And the bear got up on his hind legs and got about six up from him when a large arrow pierced its heart. And a warrior stepped from behind a tree. He said, Father? He said, My son, I've been out of your sight, but you've never been out of mine. I've been with you all the way. Sometimes we have some heartaches and trials. We must go through. I didn't say you might, but you're going to have some. But thank God he's always with us. I read this little poem and the kind of the way I look at things. Hopefully you do. A traveler crossed a frozen stream in trembling. Fear one day. Later a teamster drove his mules across and whistled all the way. Great faith and little faith alike were granted safe convoy. 
One had all the pangs of needless fear, the other all the joy. I've got a pre preacher acquaintance that I believe when he dies, you know what they're going to put on his tombstone? What you looking at? He don't like anything or anybody, I don't believe. He said to me one time, so Brother Owen said, no wonder you're happy, you've never had a problem. Kind of an idiot is that? <laughs> yes, I've had some problems too. But we just look at it differently. I've had this thing, of, and my wife will tell you, I'm the eternal optimist. It's going to get better. God's going to turn it around. And I'm 75 years old. God's always turned it around. So far, so far, I've been doing pretty, pretty good. Number four, for the joy of positions undeserved. What about the position of salvation? Isn't that wonderful? Did we deserve that? No. That's the grace of God. Wonder, by the way, it's a wonderful grace of God, by the way. It's the wonderful grace of God. Psalm 40, he lifted me up from the miry clay and the horrible pit. He lifted me up. I didn't get up myself. I didn't lift myself up. I'm on bootstraps. It's impossible. But thank God, God did that for me. That's salvation. What about the positions of service? And by the way, we're saved to serve. We're not saved to sit. God didn't say, oh, good, you're saved. Here's a recliner for you. Just enjoy yourself. Don't go to church. Don't go tithe. Don't anything construct you. Just sit here and rot. <laughs> I think not. In fact, I looked it up, and I believe the word uh, sit appears 160 times in the Bible. But the word service or serving is 400 times in the Bible. I found out when you sit, you soak, and you sour. Basically in that order. Men that I pastored at the same church 57 years when I, uh, 27 years when I went there, they were in their 50s. When I left, they were almost 80. If they were 60, now they were 87. The ones who retired and sat down died. Within two years, they were gone. But the men who got up and got dressed and just went to get coffee, just to talk, just to chat, just to get out and do something constructive, lived on. I've got one of my best preacher friends, just 90 years old. 90. A World War II veteran shot, he built out of a burning airplane in Germany, prisoner of war for nine months or so. Got that smile like a wave on a slop bucket, this big. I mean, just happy. Brother Bill, hey, are you up and at him? I'm up. <laughs> May not be Adam, but I'm up. Get that smile. I said, ready for coffee? He said, I need two pots today, sonny. And we go get it. Position just in service. Who are you? Who are you serving today? Maybe you're not in the line. Like we had a little lady named June Neighbors who kept our church nursery for 23 years of the 27 that I was there. Mrs. Neighbors was a sweetheart. They stay in that nursery until they were toddlers, and she'd, she'd get a little handkerchief out. If I can find mine, I got one here somewhere. Come out of there. <laughs> like a Baptist trying to get his tithe out of his pocket. Here we go. Now, they'd, they'd, get, they'd go to the toddler class, and she'd sit at the nursery door. Bye, sweetheart. I'm going to miss you. I knew the little brat. <laughs> Amen? Much probably she didn't kill him. But see, but that, that, that was her thing. That was her job. That was her heart. And she served it with joy. In the book of First Chronicles chapter 27, verse 28, you're talking about all the servants of David, King, the King David. This man was over the flocks. These were over the herds. These were over the, 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 the cows. These were over the, the sheep. This guy was over the, the orchards. These were over the vineyards. And the last phrase in verse 28 says, and over the sellers, now not sellers like vendors, not salesmen, but basements, caves, over the sellers of oil was Joash. Poor old Joash. Joash never got to see anybody. Hey, I'm going to go have coffee with Joash. Well, you have to get underground to do it. Oh, Joash, now I'm going to have a camera call. Well, you better get down the stairs. He's down there somewhere. But you know what about that? 
It may have been a place of humility, but it's also a place of holiness because the king put him there. The king said, Joash, this is your job. This is what I want you to do. And wherever God puts you, you be happy there, be joyful there in the church. I'm not talking about if you're a janitor at K. Bob's Industries. I'm talking about the church. Hope you hope you're joyful at other places too. Nehemiah 8:10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's how come you give you the job and hang in, hang in there and do it. Because over the cellars of all joy. We had a missionary the other day at our church. There, in at home. And he was eighty, about eighty-one. And he's still getting around pretty good for 81 years old. And he was talking about his field of South America. And he said, well, here in about two months, my wife and I are going back to Bolivia. I thought to myself, give it a break, you're 81. You know what he said? I want to finish well. I want to finish well. I don't want to just fizzle. I want to finish well, I think that's very important. Paul said that I might finish my course with joy. James said, count it all joy. Last of all, we ought to do it. We ought to serve the Lord. We ought to be good and faithful and working at Glenville Baptist Church because of heaven secured. Salvation, wonderful. God with me all the way, Yes. But there's something coming that's better. That's the redemption of our bodies. Now, I know I don't look like I'm 75. Somebody said, no, you look like you're 82. <laughs> well, I'm not. But I can remember when I was 15. My grandsons probably never would have thought I was 18 and riding on some pretty girl in my car. They can't believe that, not at my age. We played football till it got too dark to see the ball. We didn't quit. It just got, we couldn't see it anymore. We never ran out of energy. About 20 years ago now, when I was 55, had a church softball game. I got up to bat. Let her go. Bang! Over the left fielder's head. For that, I said, boy, I got a double out of that at least. I barely made it to first base before the ball hit. <laughs> I made it, but I sure didn't make second. Because I was running a lot slower. And I, and I ran track in high, school, in high school. I was in the district finals of 100. But that's when I was 18 and up today. Heaven. What a wonderful, wonderful place to which we're going. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. I don't know if I've got that up there or not. But it talks about the Holy Spirit of God being the earnest of our inheritance. What's that mean, down payment? That's earnest is a word that's kind of gone the way of the ostrich or the emu or whatever uh, because it, it, means, it means down payment. You're getting this on promise of something else. And I thought of a wonderful illustration driving up here, and I'll show it to you. That is a silver coin. Not long ago, I asked the Lord, I said, you know, I said, when we pass away, all of our, whatever we've got is to be divided among Kathy and Leslie. But, you know, let's just leave the grandson something special. It don't have to be much, just something that they can remember Papa and Nana by. So I bought several silver coins. It's cheap right now, so buy some. Not for me, I don't sell silver now, I ask a question now. I brought him one of these to keep. The rest of them are in a safety deposit box. Question, is this the inheritance? No. But this is the earnest of the inheritance. This is where Bryson can see, hey, that's what Papa's got a lot of in the safety deposit box of the bank. When the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives within your heart, you have that earnest of someday going to heaven, living forever. But the Lord Jesus and all the saints of God, a, a perfect place for us, a prepared place. A, and, and you know what's best? A people place. 
Can you see heaven with all of its splendor? The gates are of one pearl, one pearl apiece. Can you imagine the size of that pearl? Jasper wall, golden streets, mansions everywhere. But what if you were there but alone? Think about that. Oh, it's beautiful. But where's Dolores to share it with? Where's Nancy and Kathy to look it over with me? Where's my grandsons to admire it with me? Where are the saints of God, the people that I've pastored for 27 years, that are going to glory? Where are they? Because I want to see them. I thank God today that heaven is a people place. I thought about this the other day, Brother Allen. said, not scriptural. There's a book of Owen, chapter 13. <laughs> it's my opinion. I can see this. See if you can see it with me. The rapture has taken place. Now that word don't appear in the Bible. It's a catching away of the saints of God to have what have the church goes home. We are saved, we're going up, be caught up with the Lord. And we're going up toward heaven. And on the main thoroughfare of heaven, there are angelic beings like this great street. The Bible refers to seraphims in the book of Isaiah. They had six wings with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he did fly. And they're there. <whistles> Magnificent beings, they. But perhaps an archangel is the first in line. And he looks out at us. We're coming. And what does he say? Well, look at this ragtag bunch coming here. How'd they get in here? Did he say that? I say no. You know what he does say toward the book of Owen? Step back. Step back, messengers of God. Step back, you created angelic beings who've never sinned. We must give place because we... We are the servants, but these, these are the children. There's a big difference between a servant and a child, believe me. When we get home, it won't be a ragtag bunch coming in. We'll be the trophies of God. So with joy, I tell you, with joy, we ought to serve our wonderful, wonderful Lord. Would you stand with me, please?